Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Um, I'm really rather pleased to see so many people here this evening. Um, there are about 35 of you. Uh, and I have been noticing since the 18th of June um, that there is a certain element of Waterloo fatigue <laughs> in, in amongst not just our audiences, but um, more generally. So um, 35 people is a, is a good turnout, and I'm delighted. Um, you might also be pleased to know that um, whilst Waterloo fatigue may be creeping in, it doesn't appear to be amongst our visitors. Uh, and we continue to be uh, rushed off our feet with visitors to our Waterloo 2015 exhibition. And in fact, um, in the first three months, uh, our visitor numbers have been up 52%, which is um, very pleasing. And our over-the-counter shop sales, which is another source of income, have been up 100%. So um, um, we are seeing some return from uh, the exhibition. Now, um, this evening, um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Russ Foster, um, who um, is, well, I say he's an expert on Waterloo. He very well ought to be, because he's <laughs> written a book on it. Um, in fact, the book he's written, The Outcomes of Waterloo, um, I personally have a copy, I've read it, and I think it's absolutely um, excellent. Uh, and um, I'm not going to give you more of an introduction uh, to Russ. It was um, on the flyer for the talk this evening, but I am grateful to him for coming here this evening. He lives... Um, Somewhere near Salisbury. In it? Salisbury, yes. Yeah, uh, and uh, I'm very grateful to him coming here this evening. No more of an introduction. If he wants to say something about himself, he will. I rather hope, though, he'll get on with his talk. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you, Mr Chairman. At the risk of uh, annoying you, I'm going to say a little bit more about myself. <laughs> um, <laughs> It's, uh, it's actually, I think, pretty much 30 years ago since I was in the museum, which is really very scary. And I do remember coming up here because, actually, back in the early 80s, I was a graduate at Southampton University, and I finished my first degree. And that <coughs> coincided exactly with Wellington's papers being gifted to the nation in lieu of death duties. So I then spent the next three years of my life uh, working on Wellington's papers, which is how one sort of weekend when you relax and get away from Wellington's papers, what do you do? You come to a military museum and have a look around. <laughs> and there are lots of good second-hand bookshops in Winchester in those days as well. Sadly, uh, not so many now. Um, and actually, I'm not an expert in Waterloo. In terms of military history and the battle, I spent uh, three years looking at, at Wellington's civilian career, really. And actually, primarily, he's, he's Lord Lieutenancy of the County of Hampshire, which he... Uh, was in post for over 30 years until he died in 1852. And it was actually only in 2011 when I had a significant birthday when my wife was asking me what I would like to do. And I said, well, for goodness sake, don't give me a big surprise party. But what I'd really like to do uh, is go to Waterloo. I've never been there. And I was thinking of going in 2015. But, you know, well, let's go now and get it done with. So we went. And uh, what I saw that day... Uh, was literally inspiration for what followed over the next couple of years. I, I rashly resigned my teaching job, because teaching is a full-time job, uh, and you can't write a book, which is also a full-time job, and hope to stay sane. And the publishers wanted the book done, obviously, uh, before the Waterloo anniversary. So I ended up uh, doing that, and the book came out about a year ago, uh, and it's been quite well received, I think. And I think it is genuinely different, because actually it's not just a blow-by-blow military account of Waterloo, and that's all sort of dealt with in the first chapter or so. Um, it's really about the impact of the word we're using this, uh, this evening, outcomes of the battle. And I actually want to take that really right down to, to June 2015, because it's probably about a month ago now since I did do a talk about Waterloo, and obviously I've had time to sort of look at, at the media and, and see just what was being covered back in June 15, because that's all part of what interests me really, and it's the next sort of chapter in my book where I have to write another one, which instead I don't intend doing, not about that anyway. Um, now, if I had to sort of say what's the impact or the outcome, then this is a, a spoof headline, we used to use these in teaching. <laughs> um, really, to many people, and certainly to outsiders, and certainly to the French, 
uh, the outcome of Waterloo, the popular perception, is that it's all about British triumphalism. It's all about Wellington's great victory. And you can't go to too many places, towns and cities in this country, without coming across a Wellington Road or a Waterloo Terrace and so on. The London A to Z, for example, has got over 30 uh, references to Waterloo in street names. Uh, back in 2013, the National Army Museum held an online poll for the nation's greatest battle, and Waterloo was comfortably the top. So it would appear that uh, it's a cut and dry case. Um, what I'd like to suggest to you this evening, though, uh, is that following my own research, the more I got into this, the more it seemed to me to be ambiguous, really. Uh, and yes, there is triumphalism, but I think the reality is a much more interesting and complex picture. And I think it's really well summed up in this uh, cartoon from Punch, which appeared in 1903. And it shows an imaginary meeting between Wellington and Napoleon, because of course they never did meet. Uh, and uh, Wellington's just spotted that uh, it's in the press in 1903. They're about to finish the, uh, the monument to him in St. Paul's Cathedral. Now that cathedral had uh, supposedly been put there back in 1857, but then in the mid-1870s they stopped uh, building it. And it was only in 1903 that it was decided that the monument was finally going to be completed with the addition of the equestrian statue. Uh, and uh, the sort of irony in even that cartoon is that it was still uh, not until 1912, in fact, that uh, some nine years after the cartoon that the, the statue was finally finished. So the cartoon is about a specific monument, but actually it does, I think, provide a nice lead in more generally to what I'm going to be saying. Now, I've been warned on pain of death not to <laughs> repeat the history of the battle, therefore I'm not going to. Well, other audiences, I'm never quite sure how much people know. Some know more than me about the battle, and, and some people really haven't got a clue. Uh, but I've been told that you've been done to death on Waterloo. Uh, you will be aware, therefore, that it's a, what I like to see as a five-act drama, starting at about 11.30 in the morning with... Uh, uh, diversionary attacks on the Chateau of Hougamont, and I'll point that out because I will be uh, referring to that uh, towards the end of what I've got to say. Uh, in front of the main British line, Wellington on his ridge at Mont Saint Jean, and position here famously at his crossroads where there used to be an elm tree, and you will be seeing various images of, of that position uh, in, in the subsequent 200 years, so sort of be aware that when I'm talking about the crossroads I mean there. And I will also be talking about the, the Lion's Mound, which is over here you've never been to Waterloo, which certainly wasn't there in 1815, but it did appear in, in circumstances which I should be coming on to, to talk about uh, a little bit later. Obviously French infantry attacks over here early afternoon, cavalry attacks over here uh, in sort of mid to late afternoon, La Haye Saint uh, captured by the French about six in the evening, and then the final <coughs> attack by the Imperial Guard sort of over here, but uh, repulsed uh, by the British forces more or less simultaneously with the uh, arrival from the uh, east uh, of the Prussians. Uh, and the rest, as they say, is history. Uh, now, Wellington and Blücher famously met at round right about somewhere between 9 and 10 o'clock in the evening, close to what had been Napoleon's uh, battlefield headquarters at the Belle Alliance. Uh, the, uh, Wellington then rode back <coughs> to his own headquarters uh, in the village of Waterloo. Actually, Waterloo is not on that map, as I'm sure you know. I mean, the battle took place on the ridges of Mont Saint Jean, but Waterloo is. Uh, two or three miles up the road uh, and Wellington liked to name battles after his headquarters and uh, his headquarters was uh, in 1815 an inn so since 1955 it's been the, uh, the Wellington Museum in Waterloo and he got maybe a couple of hours sleep and he was awoken at three o'clock or so in the morning just after by his doctor, Dr Hume and Dr Hume informed him that the chap in the, the bed which actually was meant to have been Wellington's bed, but he didn't get to use it because his bed was used by uh, Colonel de Lancey, one of his aide de camps, camps who had uh, been, uh, as it turned out, mortally wounded. The, the leg had been amputated. It was thought he was going to survive, but uh, things went wrong. And uh, around about 3.30 in the morning, uh, Colonel de Lancey died. And rather than try and get any more sleep, Wellington sat down, in the front room on the first floor and started to write what is effectively the first British account of Waterloo. Uh, we know it as the Waterloo Dispatch. And he uh, continued writing that the following afternoon, 19th of June, uh, in Brussels. And that was then dispatched 
and brought across via Broadstairs uh, to uh, Downing Street and then to the Prince Regent, who was dining in St. James's Square on the evening of the uh, 21st of June. Uh, And that was, as I say, the the first account, really, of Waterloo. By the end of 1815, there had been over 70 accounts published in Britain already of the battle, uh, giving some idea of the triumphalism. So that was one outcome, if you like. Uh, A second early outcome is the Waterloo Medal, uh, now, the museum is very good on this. I was looking earlier. Uh, this was the first campaign medal issued to all ranks. So people have been at Catrebra, Ligny, Waterloo, and actually some of the, uh, the forces at Hal uh, who hadn't actually seen action on the 18th of June also got uh, that medal. So something like 36,000 medals issued. And Wellington was uh, fairly instrumental in ensuring that this happened because there are letters to the the Duke of York saying that he he wanted it uh, issued to all ranks. Oops. Um, You also get not just uh, literary outpourings, you get artistic outpourings. And the British institution, uh, no longer with us, I don't think, uh, had a competition for an artistic uh, recreation or impression, anyway, of the battle. And there were over 100 entries. And they selected as their winner uh, James Ward's allegory here of the triumph of Great Britain after the Battle of Waterloo, which is actually a terribly sophisticated picture with various images and allegories. And the general public didn't like it very much. And although it hung at uh, Royal Hospital in Chelsea for a few years... It seems to have disappeared from view sometime in the mid-1830s, and no one's seen the original since. So what you've got there is one of the artist's sort of uh, pre-drawings rather than the main thing. Uh, The one the public like was the sort of runner-up, we would call it, uh, by George Jones, which actually you can see for real uh, in the hall at the Royal Hospital in Chelsea, and showing uh, Waterloo towards the end of the battle, Duke ordering the advance. He said to have quite liked it on the grounds there was not too much smoke. Um, George Jones, uh, just as a, an aside, uh, looked uh, fairly, uh, fairly similar to Wellington and took great pride in the fact that he'd often be walking down the street and get accosted by someone and asked if he was the Duke. Uh, and Wellington apparently got wind of this story on one occasion and, and said that he'd never been mistaken for Mr Jones. Uh, <laughs> uh, actually, I was reading his entry in the ODNB. Um, uh, Jones, it is said, refused to go out on the day of Wellington's funeral on the grounds that people would try to bury him. But uh, <laughs> I suspect that's uh, possibly apocryphal. Um, now, another outcome was that a grateful nation... Uh, this has already been decided, actually, before Waterloo, but it was confirmed after Waterloo. The Grateful Nation voted um, a sum of money for the Duke to build what was going to be known as Waterloo Palace. And this was going to be something to rival Blenheim. Uh, the problem was it didn't get built. Uh, now, to be fair, that's not the failure of the, uh, the British nation. It's, it's more the case that Wellington ultimately decided uh, he didn't want a Blenheim Palace uh, and various architects went around the country and various sites were looked at uh, in about four or five different counties. And in the end, uh, Lord Rivers' uh, estate at Stratford say came on the market at the end of 1817 and the British taxpayer stumped up the £263,000 to, uh, to buy it along with about, I think, eight or 9,000 acres. Wellington then increased the estate to over 15,000 acres but actually, although uh, drawings were made, which you can still see at Stratfield, say, for what would have been the Waterloo Palace, um, he decided in the end that uh, he was quite happy with what he had. It was a great country retreat. Anyway, he had Warmer Castle uh, when he became Lord Warden of the St. Ports at the end of the 1820s, and did his London home, Apsley House. So there was no need for a, a Waterloo uh, Palace. So grand, though, I think Stratfield, say, is. If you've been to Stratfield, say, you've also been to Blenheim, um, they are not really comparable in terms of uh, homes fit for heroes. Uh, but this failure is, is more difficult to explain. Uh, if you go back in the mist of time to about the 13th century, uh, the Wellesley family supposedly came from Somerset. And uh, the town of Wellington uh, is, is obviously the, the place that gave Wellington his title. And the, uh, the townspeople of Wellington obviously wanted to commemorate uh, that fact and their great hero and the great battle. 
And uh, in 1817, you get a, a huge crowd, press reports of 10,000 or so, turning up to witness the laying of the foundation stone for the Wellington Monument, which is on top of Blackdown Hills. If it had been down to Devon, either on the, on the trains or on the M5, you can't really miss it. Um, but actually, things stop. Uh, it wasn't until 1854 that the monument was finally completed and it was meant to be about 20 feet higher than it actually is and there was meant to be a statue of Wellington on the top there were also meant to be four Waterloo cannon at the base which had been promised by the Prince Regent Uh, and as you can see the uh, good people of Somerset are still waiting for the cannon to arrive (laughs) and Parliament uh, made it clear uh, 28th of June 1815 with virtually a, a unanimous vote that there should be a great national memorial as well to the battle. And by the spring of 1816, competition was launched. There were over 200 entries. And the eventual winner in the spring of 1817 uh, was a design by William Wilkins. And he had great plans for an ornate column. Uh, It's going to be a similar one to Trafalgar, 280 foot high, at Portland Place, uh, at the entrance to Regent's Park. It was going to cost about £200,000. Uh, And I can assure you it's not there. It was never built. The question is, therefore, why? Not why there is triumphalism, but why, actually, uh, you don't get what was meant to have happened. And part of the answer is, uh, a large part of the answer, perhaps, is straightforward economics. Uh, As is in in the case with most major wars, you get post-war dislocation, demobilisation of troops... Times were tough in the years after Waterloo. There wasn't a lot of spare money around. Uh, And that clearly has got a lot to do with it. Uh, But certainly that's not the whole story. It's also because very, very quickly after Waterloo, there is a strand of thought that actually doesn't see the outcome as anything worth celebrating at all. And George Cruikshank, who was one of the great uh, uh, satirists of the period was producing this 15 or 17, 18 months after Waterloo, uh, which he calls the tragedy of Waterloo. And in that cartoon, you've got Wellington down here, who's actually hammering down uh, one of the, uh, the left arm of, uh, of France, the lady depicted in the centre, and you've got the Bourbons being restored and thrust down the throat of uh, France. So... Not necessarily, therefore, uh, what you might expect. And a couple of years after that, the reputation of the army has gone into decline. And not just decline, absolute reverse. You you need to remember that the army's reputation had been pretty low after the loss of the American colonies back in the 1780s. And actually what Wellington does, certainly in these peninsula years, is to restore the reputation of that army. And then, of course... Uh, Waterloo is the great zenith of that triumph but actually within three or four years the army is seen as an instrument of oppression and uh, very very famously uh, that uh, culminates on the 16th of August 1819 when you get the events on St Peter's Field just outside Manchester which become known as the Peterloo Massacre which is strictly speaking not just army it's actually local yeomanry and so forth but you do get a crowd of maybe 50 or 60,000 people Peaceable, including women and children, and in the ensuing melee, um, hundreds get injured and at least 11 killed. And the media, uh, not unsurprisingly, quickly latch on to this episode as uh, being Peterloo, obviously in, in direct reference to uh, the events at Waterloo four years before. Uh, and Wellington himself is not immune from this reversal of fortune. Uh, and we'll talk about this perhaps later but you know, unlike Nelson he doesn't get killed uh, and so he isn't sort of enshrined forever as a great hero Wellington comes back to England at the end of 1818 having been in charge uh, of the army of occupation for three years in France and literally immediately enters the government and that's a Tory government and you know, not everybody in England is a Tory and Wellington very quickly is seen as a prominent member of that government and Consequently, um, in the same year as Peter Lou, you get uh, William Hone, who's one of the great uh, pamphleteers, radical pamphleteers of the day, bringing out this uh, pamphlet, which ran to about 40 or 50 editions, um, called The Political House That Jack Built. And Wellington is seen placing his sword 
on the side of oppression uh, and the suggestion of, uh, of hone is that liberty and the pen will be mightier than the sword but um, hone is very clear that uh, Wellington is not on the side of liberty now this culminates to my mind um, fast forwarding about 10 years uh, on Waterloo Day 1832 because on that day you do finally get the inauguration of a Waterloo column the problem is from a British point of view is that that Waterloo column is in Hanover not London (laughs) and what was happening to Wellington on the 18th of uh, June 1832 is is altogether different Uh, now most of you will know that he had become Prime Minister in 1828 uh, he'd then fallen from office uh, at the end of 1830 when he had uh, famously declared against parliamentary reform and had brought in the Whig government of Lord Grey and in uh, June 1832, actually on the 7th of June 1832 what we now call the Great Reform Act became law and Wellington had been seen and was seen as the, the great opponent of that so he's famously depicted there uh, a bit like can you keeping back the waves uh, satirised as, as Dame Partington of, of Sidmouth, who apparently in days of yore had uh, tried to use her broom to keep back the, the, uh, the floods in Devon from uh, swamping her house. A famous speech had been made to this effect uh, in, in uh, Taunton in 1831 and then uh, became the cartoon. Wellington himself that day actually was uh, sitting for one of the numerous portraits that were done of him uh, and as he was uh, riding home to Absley House through London, he was surrounded by a mob. And had he not been assisted by a couple of veterans and some metropolitan policemen, uh, it's not impossible that he would have more or less literally been lynched. And he got back to Absley House and sort of raised his hat and turned to the crowd and said, Good morning, gentlemen, you know, a funny day to choose. Um, and that's what happened. So the National Memorial to Waterloo is actually not a monument, uh, certainly not a column anyway, Um, it's a bridge. Um, This wasn't meant to be the case. Uh, The Strand Bridge Company had been uh, founded uh, in uh, uh, 1809 by Act of Parliament. In 1816 there was an amendment to that Act of Parliament which renamed the Strand Bridge the Waterloo Bridge Company. And on the second anniversary of Waterloo, on the 18th of June 1817, the Prince Regent turned up to uh, officially open Waterloo Bridge and he had the Duke of York on his left arm and the Duke of Wellington uh, on his other arm and the three of them together processed across the bridge Uh, and that by default really became the National Memorial to Waterloo the great thing was it didn't cost taxpayers anything because this was a private company and they put in all the money and actually even until I think the mid 1870s you had to pay a toll even as a a foot (coughs) traveller to cross the bridge so it became self-financing Now, um, it is fair to say uh, that really after 1832, uh, things do change somewhat. And that's partly because Wellington is no longer in the absolute forefront of politics. He's still an important player in politics down to the mid-1840s. But he's no longer in in quite the the front line in in the same way that he had been in the previous two decades. So Wellington's (laughs) reputation tends to solidify as the older statesman of the nation, and people can remember uh, his military uh, career a bit more fondly. So you do get, in the last 10, 15 years of his life, um, a fresh uh, outpouring of statues. And not just in England, this is very much a a British phenomenon. Uh, So just a couple of uh, Scottish examples. The uh, uh, one in Glasgow... uh, outside the Royal Exchange, which was inaugurated in 1844, although very controversial because it was actually designed by uh, an Italian, Carlo Maraschetti, and the Times ran a big campaign against how dare you allow an Italian to, to do this, they'll do it all wrong. It's actually worse than that because uh, Maraschetti had become a French citizen, but it seems to, uh, <laughs> seems to, uh, seems to have passed the, the Times by, but it's uh, even more amusing than it uh, otherwise would be. Uh, and then... Um, in the last year of Wellington's life, as it turned out, on the 18th of June, 1852, Sir John Steele's uh, statue of Wellington outside the Register House in Edinburgh. Huge crowds turn up, about 20,000, 25,000, to see this unveiled. And the headline, I kid you not, is true, and never be, uh, let it be said to you that the uh, Victorians don't have a sense of humour. The headline the next day was, The Iron Duke in Bronze by Steele. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. 
So um, if that's what's going on in Britain, um, the sort of parallel story that I'm sort of trying to tell is uh, what's going on, on on the battlefield itself. Well, actually, if you look at that, it's an aquatint from 1834 when Wellington's you know, dreadfully unpopular in Britain, um, it would appear that the, you know, the memorials and so on uh, are doing OK and the British are being triumphalist. But actually, uh, things aren't as they appear. The, uh, the obelisk you see here is actually to uh, Colonel Gordon, the man who died in Wellington's bed in the early hours after Waterloo. That had been put there by Gordon's uh, six brothers and sisters in 1817 at their own expense. So that's a personal family memorial. Uh, the memorial you see here is to the Hanoverians, who had fought in Wellington's army, and that was there by around about 1825 or so. Uh, but surely you might think then, well, OK, fair enough, but there's the British memorial there, because you've got the British lion at the top. Uh, but again, not so. Um, now, that's the lion's man that I was uh, referring to when I showed you the, the map of the battlefield at the start. Uh, and that was actually created by order of uh, King William I of the Netherlands, who had the idea in about 1819, uh, and work starts in about 1823. You get about 2,000 people working on this over the course of a couple of years. And it is supposed to mark the spot where his son, the Prince of Orange, technically a senior commander in the Allied army, had been quite lightly wounded, I think, in the right shoulder, about six o'clock or so in the evening of Waterloo. And the lion that you see on top, therefore, is not the British lion, it's a Dutch lion. And actually, Wellington's view of this was that, well, they'd taken about 300,000 cubic metres of earth there from the sort of front slope uh, on his... Uh, right front, uh, and when he first saw this in 1825, he said, they've spoiled my battlefield. Mm -hmm. uh, and certainly most veterans who visited uh, in the generation after that uh, entirely shared that view. And if you go forward another 20 years <laughs> to this thing which becomes known as the Lion's Mound, um, the outcome is that it's you know, less a war memorial than... Uh, uh, a very handy place uh, to make uh, commercial capital because there's no, no denying that it's a sort of blot on the battlefield landscape but there is no better place to see the battlefield from uh, and you can see that by the mid-1840s people decided well, you just let people go up it you stick a fence around it you put a couple of kiosks there you put in a stone staircase 226 steps and you charge people half a franc to go up and that's what's going on um, now, a, a fonder outcome uh, is the one which Wellington himself institutes to uh, commemorate Waterloo, and that's the event that uh, becomes known as the Waterloo Banquet. It's not entirely clear when this started. Uh, Wellington was in the habit of having anniversary dinners on the, uh, the date of some of his great victories, so it's unsurprising that, that Waterloo obviously figured uh, high on his calendar it seems to have been a fairly informal thing to start with. Anyway, he's out of the country until sort of the end of 1818. So probably starts in about 1821. And then the press is much more clear about it in 1822 because the Times carries a notice that invitations have been sent out. And from then the thing rapidly takes off as a, a key event in the almost the national calendar, even though this is actually a private dinner. Uh, and Wellington himself, who'd... Uh, taken over Apsley House from his older brother at the end of the 1820s actually spent a lot of money on having created what became known as the Waterloo Gallery uh, and that dinner in the Waterloo Gallery, the first one that took place there would have been uh, 1830 and the events become so well known that five, five years later the, uh, the event's been memorialised in oils and you get uh, William IV actually insisting uh, in 1837 that his doctors got to keep him alive again, for, for keep him alive for another couple of days because he was dying, because otherwise Wellington would have to cancel the banquet. Um, the, uh, the situation was you'd normally get about 70 to 80 people attending. As some officers died, inevitably, then more junior officers uh, were invited. So the numbers stay fairly constant at around about 80 or 90 down, of course, to, to Wellington's own passing in 1852. Now, what they were celebrating, uh, certainly by mid-century, if you were to ask the question of someone in Britain, what were the outcomes of Waterloo? And I think the answer is uh, threefold. Firstly, that it had been a great military victory. 
And that point, I think, is the message of Sir David Wilkie's fabulous picture, which has actually been commissioned by Wellington as, as long ago as, I think, 18, 18, 18 or 19. And Wilkie only actually got to, to work on the picture in uh, 1820, and it went on display at the Royal Academy in May 1822. Uh, so very, very famous. Um, you've got the Waterloo Dispatch there, or at least... Uh, someone reading it in the, uh, in the London Gazette. But that isn't just any old somebody. I mean, Wilkie is actually painting figures from life here. And the, the figure who's actually reading the newspaper out to the assembled crowd is actually a veteran of Quebec. He'd been with Wolfe at Quebec back in the 1750s. Uh, you've got the chap here who'd been at Victoria with Wellington. Even the dog, whose name was Duke, had been in the peninsula. Uh, and what that picture is surely saying, and I'm no art expert either, uh, but what that's saying is here are some of the heroes of Britain's battles of, of living memory, but actually what's happened now in 1815 has eclipsed all of them. This is the greatest military victory. Uh, the second lesson is what today we would perhaps call a peace dividend. Um, highly unusual memorials, not so very far from here. It's in the grounds of Romsey Abbey. Uh, you next go to Romsey, care to have a look. It's uh, by an anonymous architect. It just says that uh, a young architect of the town um, must date from around 1850. But what it says was that Waterloo, uh, British valour was triumphant and secured to the contending powers of Europe tranquility and peace. Uh, and I was really quite struck when I was doing my research a couple of years back. Uh, there was a letter to the Times, you know, even in the 1830s, saying, do you realise, Mr. Editor, this is the longest period of European peace we've had since the Thirty Years' War. And you know, by 1850, therefore, Europe's been at peace for 35 years. Uh, and people were very conscious of the fact that they had had uh, a generation then of European peace. And the following year after that, 1851, you get the Great Exhibition. And if you read the accounts of the Great Exhibition, it's very clear, too, that people make a connection between Waterloo and peace and the chance, therefore, for the economy to develop and for the nation to prosper. And by the mid-19th century, Britain is literally becoming the workshop of the world. And it's no coincidence that Wellington was a huge fan of the Great Exhibition. He went about eight times. Uh, and he, he literally is, is receiving bigger cheers, if you read eyewitness accounts, than uh, either the Queen Victoria or Prince Albert. And obviously with the Duke there as well, you <coughs> didn't need uh, people to spell out the fact that the hero of Waterloo and the, uh, the consequent peace and the development of the nation as a great industrial power were sort of all bound up into one, really. So, had he died in 1832, then Wellington's <coughs> reputation would have been extremely mixed. As he survived for another 20 years and didn't finally die until September 1852, uh, the outcome of his passing was a great national event. I mean, this was one of the great state occasions of the 19th century. Uh, actually, it took two months to arrange, so it was literally mid-November before Wellington was finally buried. Uh, and even at a conservative estimate, um, you get one and a half million people going up to London for the funeral. Hampshire Chronicle actually claims two and a half million, which uh, I suspect is a bit over the odds. But special trains were being put on from Southampton, Winchester, for people to go to. Because of the development of the railways in the 1830s and 40s, this was the first truly great national event like that that people from outside London could attend, uh, and many people clearly did. Uh, and you would think that that was a turning point, and, and clearly it was. Uh, now you certainly can't have Wellington's Waterloo banquet at Apsley House now that the Duke is dead. Uh, nevertheless, um, what struck me as the more important turning point, and one that I was unprepared for uh, doing the research, because actually this is an untold story as far as I was aware, is that the real turning point actually comes with the Crimean War. And within, literally within about 12 months of Wellington's death, you get uh, the outbreak of hostilities which we do now remember as the Crimean War. If you read uh, newspapers like the Times, other national papers like the uh, Morning Post and so forth, it's clear that people expected celebrations to continue as normal. Now, normal would have meant, for example, uh, big parades at horse guards, or across in Ireland, big military reviews in Phoenix Park, Dublin. 
and people turn up. But actually, absolutely nothing happens. And nothing happens because it's been uh, let known from on high, i.e. the government, that it would not be appropriate to commemorate Waterloo at a time when the nation is newly allied with France and is about to go to war against the Russians. And you even get some hopeful people turning up in, uh, in June 1854, hoping that these parades will take place. But nothing happens. So it's the Crimean War that, that puts us a, a very sudden end to sort of local commemorations that had been going on for a generation. And once that's all over, uh, in May 1856, we even get a few optimists hoping that it might resume, but it doesn't particularly. But you do get uh, some more Wellington or Waterloo memorials, and uh, one of the most uh, famous, and certainly uh, the most uh, well-attended, 100,000 people turn up in Manchester on the edge of Piccadilly Gardens in August 56 to see... Yet a new Wellington statue. But if you consider the ones I showed you earlier uh, in Scotland, they are equestrian uh, statues. They're Wellington on his horse. Uh, This is Wellington in a frock coat, coming back from a debate in the House of Lords, and he's got a speech in his hand. This is a a, a civilian Wellington. It's not a military Wellington. Uh, Now, a few months later... The Queen was at Crowthorne in Berkshire to lay the foundation stone for a school. And she went back a couple of years later to officially open uh, Wellington College, another supposed national memorial to the Duke. Uh, Whether Wellington would have been happy with the idea of school as a national memorial, I'm really not convinced. Uh, This seems to have been very much the brainchild of the uh, Prime Minister back in 1852, Lord Derby, uh, and also Prince Albert. And I'm fairly sure this wouldn't have happened had Wellington still been alive either. Um, a lot of people don't seem to know that the, uh, what you call the Houses of Parliament, Westminster Palace, very badly damaged in a fire back in 1834. And the rebuilding of the palace took place over about 20 years. By the mid-1850s, they were ready to start the sort of interior design. And again, competitions were launched uh, for a suitable uh, picture for the Royal Gallery, which connects the House of Commons with the House of Lords. Uh, the popular favourite was a uh, chap called Sidney Pollard. You can see the picture in Leeds Art Gallery. And it shows French cavalry being repulsed <laughs> during the Battle of Waterloo. But actually, Prince Albert, who was maybe a touch German, um, opted for this image instead of uh, Wellington meeting Blücher at La Belle Alliance after the battle. In other words, it puts the Prussians absolutely centre stage uh, and sees Waterloo as a, as a coalition victory as opposed to a British victory. I, I really can't believe that had Wellington still been alive, this picture would have ended up where it did. Um, you've also got continuing literary outcomes, and uh, much to the annoyance of the British press, the, uh, the great uh, book which made an impact which concerned Waterloo, or dealt with Waterloo in passing anyway, during the 1860s was uh, Victor Hugo's Les Miserables. Um, I have to say, of all the books I've read in my sort of two years of research for my book, the one I enjoyed most was uh, Les Miserables. You you may have seen the film or the show, whatever, if you haven't read the book, I mean, you are in for a treat. Uh, I mean, Victor Hugo has about a 25-chapter diversion all about Waterloo, uh, how he claims that basically the the French were cheated. (laughs) It's hugely entertaining. It's dreadfully bad history. I mean, you get stories of hundreds of Frenchmen being chucked down the well at Hougamont, which is complete rubbish. I mean, it's been archaeologically excavated, and they found a bit of a horse, but nothing else. There's certainly no Frenchmen down the well. Um, But uh, his main contention, there was no intention of liberty, this idea that Waterloo is a battle of ideas, uh, but that uh, he's a great hero, Napoleon, and Hugo's uh, father had been a, a general in Napoleon's army, so he was hardly unbiased uh, that, that Waterloo was a battle of the first importance won by a commander of the second rank, which uh, didn't play too well in Britain. Interestingly enough, though, uh, four years on, so the 50th anniversary of the battle, a really uh, interesting uh, editorial in the Times newspaper which was sort of syndicated to all the provincial newspapers. So pretty much every newspaper in the country carried this report, or this uh, editorial. And actually taking, if anyone thinks that Waterloo is about triumphalism, 
that's what the Times was saying on the 50th anniversary. That actually, you know, concede there was a great uh, heroic military effort being made by the people involved, but in terms of, again, its ideas, uh, because we're entering an age of liberal Britain, is it actually something which uh, needs to be remembered in the same way? And cross on the, on the battlefield, or actually not the battlefield, but what looks finally, although we're talking about the 75th anniversary now, a British memorial to uh, the British dead at Waterloo. Uh, well, again, things are not as they appear. Um, this almost certainly wouldn't have happened had it not been for the fact that back in the mid-1880s, the Belgian authorities were, were talking about... Uh, reusing uh, several graveyards and in those graveyards there were some British veterans from Waterloo buried and they included one or two significant people like uh, Colonel Alexander Gordon who I'd mentioned and uh, chap called Sergeant Edward Cotton who may have come across his account of Waterloo and uh, the uh, British minister in Brussels happened to be Lord Vivian whose uh, grandfather had uh, commanded some light cavalry at Waterloo and he thought this was dreadful so on his initiative he secured a plot of land at Avea Cemetery and turned that into a mausoleum, uh, which was also going to serve as a memorial to the British dead more generally from the Waterloo campaign. But, strictly speaking, it's not really, therefore, a national memorial. The British government would only contribute £500 towards the £2,000 which was necessary for the uh, Statue of Britannia. And the problem with this is that it is on the outskirts of northeast Brussels. And if you know where Waterloo is, well, it's about five or six miles south. Uh, I have to say, I didn't know this, uh, this uh, memorial existed until a couple of years ago. And the reason is, if you go to Waterloo, well, you're actually about ten miles from it, so no reason why you wouldn't know. So it is a, a case of too little, too late, and it is in the wrong place. Uh, the same cannot be said, though, for these. These are some new battlefield memorials that were appearing by the turn of the century. Uh, but, again, sadly, uh, to recount, they are not British. So, on the left, you, top left, you've got the Wounded Eagle, which is supposed to indicate the spot where the last stand of the uh, Imperial Guard took place late in the evening on the 18th of June. Uh, you've got a, a Belgian memorial, which is pretty much, well, is... Uh, at one edge of the, uh, of the crossroads at the centre of the battlefield. And then, highly incongruously, you've got a column to Victor Hugo on the grounds that he wrote Les Miserables, which is, is well beyond my powers of comprehension, I'm afraid. So, um, from the Lion's Mound, what you've got from around about 1900, or maybe just after, is this. Uh, there's the crossroads. The elm tree had been cut down around about 1819, actually. Um, but... No, it's not just the Lion's Man now, it's Le Hameau du Lyon. It's, it's a little hamlet. It's because hotels have grown up. Uh, you've got a thing here, which is the big one, which is doubles as a museum. Uh, and uh, commercialisation has run rampant. Uh, but if you go forward just a few more years after that, you will see it's changed yet again with uh, another unwelcome addition, supposedly in time for the centenary, uh, and this is a, a big building which actually houses what is an impressive panorama. It's, it's about 200 feet long and it shows French cavalry charging up the slopes. Uh, but whether that's the right place to put it or the right building to put it, I'm really not sure. Uh, there was a former British MP, a chap called Edward Moon, who did a big tour of the battlefield in June 1914, a fairly significant date. And he goes around and says, well, how's it all looking? And he describes this thing as a gasometer, which I think has sort of nailed it quite well. Uh, and he complains that on one of the walls of these buildings there's a big advertisement for Blackpool Beach. Uh, and that the best thing to do for the centenary would be to have, he uses the phrase, a clean sweep of buildings. Uh, now, that, of course, doesn't happen. Um, People seem to think that there were going to be great national celebrations on the centenary of Waterloo. And I've read some fairly reptile history books by eminent scholars that, that repeat this. But actually, when I researched into what was going to happen, I really couldn't find anything. What there was was a, a Member of Parliament who stood up in, uh, in the last days of 1913, a chap called Sir Hildred Carlyle, and he asked the government, or the Secretary of State, what is the government planning to do for the centenary of Waterloo? 
And the answer was, from the War Office, nothing. We had no plans to celebrate Waterloo. Um, there was going to be um, an imperial exhibition at the Crystal Palace in 1915. This, I think, was to keep the French happy, because there was no reference to Waterloo in it, but it just happened to be 100 years after Waterloo, and was a neat sort of follow-on from the Great Exhibition in 1851, but nothing overtly Waterloo. In the event, of course, all this is or was academic, because... Uh, by June the 18th, 1815, Waterloo was in the German sector of the Western Front. And what you got were you know, British soldiers leaving from Waterloo Station. And uh, a few weeks after that, uh, Wellington's uh, tomb in, in uh, St. Paul's Cathedral. Until 1915, there have been three standards along that wall. You can still see there's an empty holder, as I, I checked a month ago. <laughs> Uh, the Prussian standard was taken down in 1915 and hasn't been replaced. And as you that was aware, uh, a couple of years after that, the British royal family, of course, changed its name from Saxe-Coburg-Gotha to Windsor. Uh, when it was all over, although not until 1924, the belated centenary exhibition did finally take place. It was decided, though, that rather than hold it at the uh, Crystal Palace, they should build a brand new venue. And the consequence, or the outcome, was Wembley Stadium. And I bet there aren't too many people that think or know that, sort of indirectly, therefore, the national building to commemorate the centenary of Waterloo was Wembley. And there was a great piece in the Times, actually, on the uh, 18th of June, 1924, where they're saying, well, I bet all these youngsters coming along, there won't be anyone able to tell us the, uh, the significance of the date. Uh, but that's why it was there, and was a huge success. Uh, meanwhile, at the same time, although actually technically the year before, 1923, it was discovered that the, the official, or had become the official National Memorial, Waterloo Bridge, was actually subsiding. And there was then a big argument about what should happen. Should the bridge be conserved uh, or should the bridge be demolished and a new one put in its place? Lord Curzon, formerly the Foreign Secretary, uh, took up the, uh, the defence uh, for the preservation of Waterloo Bridge. Uh, but in the event he lost, um, it was decided in 1934 that actually the, the old Waterloo Bridge should go. And you see there pictures of the cranes removing the first stones. It was another decade on at the end of 1945 before the new Waterloo Bridge was finally opened uh, by the, uh, the former leader of the uh, London County Council, Chuck Lord Herbert Morrison, of whom you may have heard. He was apparently quite serious in believing and arguing that the bridge should be called Morrison Bridge. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I, I spent a, a jolly half an hour. There is absolutely nothing on the bridge indicating that it's got anything to do with Waterloo. But, I mean, technically, that's a, the National Memorial to Waterloo, but there's nothing on the bridge saying so. Um, 125th anniversary. I, I missed this, actually, in the book, or the, the true significance of it. Uh, now, it's a bit of deja vu, really. You get Germans again on the, uh, <laughs> on the Waterloo battlefields. Only grand celebrations have to be uh, put on hold. But what's more interesting, I think, is what's going on in Britain on the 18th of June, 1940, on the 125th anniversary. There's a chap called Charles de Gaulle, who is in uh, ooh, Whitehall Gardens, and he is making broadcast to the French nation. And that is generally seen uh, as the core to the nation, the start of the French resistance. And there's another gentleman called Winston Churchill, who on the 125th anniversary is making a speech in the House of Commons saying that this will be their finest hour. Now, Churchill has a fantastic sense of history. I cannot believe that it is absolutely just coincidence that that speech and de Gaulle's speech were made on that day. This is the two of them uh, pronouncing on a new belle alliance uh, against uh, a new common enemy. But um, all rivalries linger, of course, and I, I love the story that I've not been able, I really can't decide how true this is, but uh, when Churchill did finally pass on 25 years later, 
It said that he wanted his uh, funeral cortege to depart from Waterloo Station on the grounds that if de Gaulle was still around, he would have to come <laughs> and, uh, and stand there and salute. Um, I'm inclined to think there's something in it, because if you're actually going from, from London out to Bladen and Woodstock and Oxford, you'd leave from Paddington, so there's no need to leave from Waterloo. So I suspect there may be something in that. Um, uh, now, the same year, as it happened, uh, was the 150th anniversary. Uh, very, very low-key. Uh, and I've actually I've spoken to one or two people who can remember the, uh, the 150th anniversary who, who confirm that fact. Uh, issue of one or two sort of commemorative coins. There was a grand dinner in the Guildhall, uh, and a little story I heard about this, which is wonderful. Um, the, uh, the French ambassador was invited to come along <laughs> and replied that regretfully he would be unable to attend because he was busy organising uh, the French celebration for Hastings 900. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, in terms of uh, events beyond that, moving forward certainly to a time that I can remember, um, the, uh, the film Waterloo, actually, 1970, a very, very good uh, film uh, or battlefield sequences in the days before computer-generated images, which I certainly used to use quite a lot when teaching Waterloo. Um, uh, the, uh, the Bernard Cornwall novels uh, in the 1980s, and particularly when they were transferred to television in the early 90s, uh, brought the story to a new generation, as in uh, more comedic terms did uh, Stephen Fry, firstly in playing uh, Wellington in Blackadder III in 1987, although actually a, an appalling depiction of Wellington, just about every characteristic <laughs> is wrong. <laughs> uh, plays Wellington as a loud shouting maniac and shooting and so on, and absolutely every detail is wrong, uh, but an impressionable uh, impact on a younger audience. Uh, and even more so, actually, in 1999, the special Blackadder that was filmed for the Millennium Dome, you might recall, uh, called Blackadder Goes uh, Back and Forth, where um, Blackadder lands on and kills the Duke of Wellington, having been sent to try and get hold of his boots, comes back to the present to find that uh, everyone is speaking Fran uh, French and the Christmas Day broadcast is, is coming from Versailles, uh, which is an interesting sort of counterfactual take on, on the outcome of Waterloo. Um, and uh, not uh, forgetting the, uh, the £5 note, which for 20 years or so uh, bore Wellington on the back of it. Uh, now, when that first began in 1971, Prime Minister at the time, a chap called Edward Heath, was terribly unhappy and thought, in fact, that showing, or suggesting even, that Frenchmen running away on the back of a £5 note was, was too triumphalist in days of uh, supposed European unity. Um, his successor, with whom he didn't always see eye to eye, um, <laughs> apparently, I had this on very good authority from someone who was there. Um, Mrs. Thatcher invited uh, President Juscar uh, to, uh, to dinner at Downing Street in the 80s and sort of sat him in the room so that dead opposite him there were big uh, portraits of Napoleon, not sorry, Napoleon, Nelson and Wellington. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, was, was quite happy to sort of joke about this informally afterwards. Um, now, what was what a, not a joke uh, from that era? On the battlefield in the early 70s, 1973 to be precise, the Belgian authorities, uh, government, was wanting to put a motorway literally through the middle of the battlefield. And this was the catalyst for uh, the, uh, the eighth Duke of Wellington and uh, the uh, then uh, Marquess of Anglesey getting together uh, and forming uh, what was then called the Waterloo Committee, now the Waterloo Association. And thankfully, with their lobbying, uh, the Belgian authorities did agree to reroute the motorway, although it's still incredibly close. I mean, this is Hougamore Farm down here, so I mean, literally it's, it's only a couple of hundred yards or so. Uh, but it's uh, certainly better than, than going right through. As we come forward uh, towards the 200th anniversary, uh, it, it seemed to me that there had been, really, since the day after the battle, actually, literally, uh, a tension between uh, genuine commemoration and what I would call commercialisation. Uh, you would have to say, though, that for 200 years it's been a very, very uneven battle. Uh, Commercialisation has worn hands down. It did seem, though, uh, in 2013, that things were perhaps going to take a happier course 
because having previously said that the uh, coalition government that no money was going to be made available to commemorate Waterloo 200, George Osborne took a lot of people by surprise at the end of June 2013 when he said that, in fact, uh, a million pounds would be made available for battlefield restoration projects. Uh, although I suspect what he then added was more of a soundbite relating to uh, <laughs> more recent political events when he talked about uh, the coalition forces and a discredited former regime. Uh, what was interesting, though, within hours perhaps not minutes, but certainly within hours of him making that statement, the Foreign Office had to rush out <laughs> a clarifying statement to uh, reassure the French that uh, nothing triumphalous was intended and that the two had been uh, great uh, friends and allies uh, since, uh, since Waterloo. So, um, now... Coming right up to date, in terms of what's happened in, uh, in the days uh, leading up to, and indeed on, the 200th anniversary, uh, just to finish off, um, what struck me, and I rather sadly sort of went through all the newspaper uh, television listings for the, the week of Waterloo, there was not a single programme during the week of the 200th, 200th anniversary about either Wellington or Waterloo. The only thing on that week was, uh, I think, uh, part two of Napoleon's uh, series by Andrew Roberts. There was a brief uh, feature on Waterloo on Newsnight with Evan Davis, although it was incredibly late at night. I had to track it down on iPlayer. The reason I tracked it down was that various irate people wrote into the press complaining that it had been incredibly biased, anti-Wellington, dumbed down, and was trying to sort of preach the virtues of a European army. Uh, but quite frankly, being on at half eleven at night on the 17th of June, I suspect not too many people were watching anyway. Uh, the same night, um, <coughs> various people had attended one of the many, many uh, Waterloo dinners that uh, were held up and down the country. Uh, I particularly like this one because it was old Wellingtonians. Uh, and the... Uh, the little story that found its way into the newspapers was that the descendant of Marshal Blucher, who'd been invited to the dinner, was delayed at, uh, at the airport and so arrived late, and so the Prussians had turned up late again. <laughs> <laughs> um, the following day, uh, when I was uh, privileged to be invited along, the, uh, the National Service of Commemoration was held in St Paul's, uh, there hadn't been one back in 1965 and there hadn't been one on the centenary so uh, in, in a sense the, the first one for a very long time certainly on a uh, significant anniversary which was uh, attended by uh, Prince Charles and, and uh, Prince Edward as well and according to uh, the uh, official programme for that day a month ago uh, this was all about the fact that uh, we now live in an era of European unity and David Cameron turns up with the President of the European Parliament, whose name escapes me, uh, and uh, inside the commemorative uh, brochure there, you had a, a little letter from the, uh, the French ambassador uh, assuring us that the French had got over the events of Waterloo. <laughs> now, that take was very much influenced, uh, as has all of the Waterloo 200 preparation, by the, the bigger European perspective on Waterloo, and the Europeans actually have much more agreed about Waterloo and its outcome and how it should be seen, which is that it should be seen as a, a symbol of the uselessness or futility of war and, and the need and necessity for European uh, unity. And this was, uh, to a certain extent, large extent indeed, uh, borne out by what happened. So... Uh, reenactments have been happening at Waterloo for a long time. Uh, they, they are annual. They do a big, uh, a biggish reenactment every five years these days. And the, the one that took place uh, a month or so ago was the biggest there's ever been, with uh, over, I think, five, maybe six thousand people uh, turning up from literally from across the globe uh, to take part in uh, in two days of reenacting. Uh, the more serious stuff, though, um, a new visitor centre. Uh, which you can see there, not quite complete when I took that back in February, uh, but actually opened in May. And pleasingly, they've actually put a lot of it so it is underground. 
and it does list for the first time all the regiments that took place in the battle, uh, not just from the British Army, but uh, from the Prussian and the French Army as well. Uh, and on the 17th of June, also, uh, Prince Charles was across uh, with the, uh, the current Duke, the 9th Duke, uh, at Waterloo, and going down to the restored Hougoumont farm, which, when I went there three years ago, was an absolute disaster. And it had actually been tenanted by farmers down to about 2006, when the last tenant died. But it really was literally falling apart. Uh, and a lot of money has been spent on the restoration. That's, that's where the, the million pounds that uh, George Osborne pledged ended up going. Uh, the reason that Prince Charles went there was that at long, long last, after 200 years, he got to unveil an official memorial to British soldiers who actually fought and died in the Waterloo campaign. Uh, I'd love to go and see it. I'm waiting for the uh, sort of rush of June to, to finally die down uh, by a female British artist called Vivian Mallet called Closing the Gates on War and a couple of uh, Wellington quotations either side of it. But one has to conclude by still questioning, in fact, whether it is over. And my favourite story from the last month has undoubtedly been this one. Uh, the Belgian government wanted to issue a commemorative two euro coin. <laughs> And the French objected, <laughs> despite the uh, slide I showed you just now, on the grounds that uh, Waterloo has a particular resonance. <laughs> uh, and the Belgians actually got round this by issuing a two and a half euro coin, because it's a, not a, a common denomination. They can do that without having to get the consent of other people in the EU. So there are some two and a half euro commemorative uh, Waterloo coins around, if you can get hold of one. <laughs> and the French have been outwitted. And interestingly enough, um, despite the official take uh, and presentation of Waterloo 200 as, as about European unity and so on, the image that was on several British newspapers, including two of the quality press on the 19th of June, was this one. <laughs> <laughs> And at that point, I think I'll stop. <laughs> Russ, one, one memorial you didn't mention is the statue of Wellington, which now resides in Aldershot. Mm. Um, there's a bit of a history behind it. There is, yeah. But what that history is. Yeah, there is. Yeah, yeah. That. When, I've, when I've done these talks, I've, I've done different versions, obviously. Um, I also kept that in. The, uh, the statue you are referring to was uh, actually originally sited on Hyde Park Corner, um, opposite Apsley House, Wellington's London home, and that was officially inaugurated in, I think, September 1846. It was a huge, great thing. You know, about 30 tonnes of Waterloo cannon get melted down to create it. Um, Wellington liked it. Pretty much everyone else hated it. Um, there's a chap called uh, Lord Francis Edgerton who described it as a bad thing in a bad place. Dickens led a campaign against it in household words. But <laughs> When the Duke was still alive, they can't possibly take this thing down. Uh, but come the 1870s, when there were issues of traffic congestion around Hyde Park Corner, there's a, actually there's a biggish debate about it in the House of Lords, because you get one or two people still saying, you can't remove Wellington's statue, it's dreadful. You, know, you can't, no one would think about taking um, Nelson out Trafalgar Square. Uh, but it was decided that they would uh, remove it. And the argument was... Uh, you know, to, uh, to ease the traffic congestion. And then Pickfords, of all people, will get hired to take this statue <laughs> from uh, Hyde Park Corner to Aldershot. And you're right, there's, a, there's an account of it going through Guildford, and it takes them about two days. Um, and that's how it comes to be in Guildford. And it gets there, I think, it's 1884. There's, there's a lot of, in Wellington's archive, there's a lot of correspondence about the statue from the mid 40s and people complaining about it. It actually originates back in the late 30s when you get public subscriptions to provide the money to uh, to get it made. So, yeah, I could have put that one. I mean, there's so many Wellington statues, you have to uh, <laughs> pick and choose. There's an obelisk in Phoenix Park, Dublin. There is, yeah. That's, that's what I normally put in, actually. Because uh, I've got that because he was born in Dublin. 
Yep, he was. Merrion Street in Dublin, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because, because again, in terms of national heroes, the great Englishman is an Irishman, of course, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but that one, it, it's, uh, the one in Dublin is by Robert Smirk, isn't it? I don't know. You know what it is, yeah. But it, well, no, the reason, the reason it's not there is, um, well, I kept in the one of, uh, of, on the Black Dan Hills, because I come from Somerset, so I'm biased. But uh, it's, it's pretty much the same story. It was meant to be taller, and was meant to be a statue of Wellington on the top, and they, it's not finished, therefore. But they blew up Nelson, you see. The, the, the Irish blew up Nelson. Oh, the IRA did blow up uh, one of them, didn't they? Nelson's column in, in the main street. Yeah. But but the one you're talking about, the Robert Smirk one in Phoenix Park, yeah. does does fit my thesis of a memorial which is not, not started enthusiastically but not finished as was intended. Another memorial to um, to the Battle of Waterloo is actually a Dean Church, uh, not part of Hampshire. It's one of the earliest buildings in Codestone, and um, a lot of the architectural features inside it are low country church features. They've got painted glass rather than stained glass, and it was um, paid for by a Belgian family as a great commemoration to the celebration of the freeing of Europe from a terrible dictatorship. And that was done very early. That was um, that was okay. built by the by about 1820. Right. Yeah. Now, now, I didn't know that. And I, when I did a similar talk to the Waterloo Association last year, there are there is a there's something called Waterloo churches, and there are I think it's about 25 or so. Mm. Which again, it, well, if you look at the big parliamentary debate at the end of June 1815, there are lots of MPs of ideas about what there should be, and churches are one of the, the popular suggestions. Other people want obelisks. Other people want a great memorial with every, with every soldier's name carved on it, which is a really interesting idea in 1815. And you get people saying, that's ridiculous, that cost a fortune, which is an important thing. But, um, but in the end, they, you know, they settle on this column, which doesn't then get built. Um, so the churches... The interesting thing on that one is it was a Belgian family. Yeah, that's, that, so that's interesting, Belgian certainly, family. yeah, yeah. Yep. I read a very interesting article um, by a Church of Ireland historian recently, and um, Wellington's family actually emigrated from the UK in the 1500s, went over to Ireland, yep. and the name then was Coley, yep. C-O-L-L-E-Y. That's right. And um, it was a distant cousin of Coley's, a Garrett Wesley. Yeah, Garrett Wesley is... died childless. And was going to leave his estate in Ireland to Charles and John Wesley, who we all know were the great mm. uh, originators of the Methodist Church. And uh, but they, they were at Westminster School at the time and didn't want it, and so he went to uh, where the Duke of Wellington's grandfather. Yeah, yeah, it's his grandfather, isn't it, Garrett That's Wesley? Right. And as you say, the, the the name in those days was spelled well, Wesley. Wesley, and it was. Well, he changed it to he, went, he was Coley then, changed yeah, yeah. It to Wesley, uh, and then Wellesley. Yeah, it becomes uh, it's uh, it's uh, the first Duke of Wellington's eldest brother, Richard, who decides he wants to spell it Wellesley when he succeeds to yes. the title. Yeah. And then, interestingly enough, it's, it's when he gets out to India as Governor-General in May 1798 that Wellington actually starts signing it Wellesley for the s- yeah. first time because he knows his brother, I suspect, isn't going to employ him if he doesn't <laughs> <laughs> follow uh, the new family convention. Yeah. We've seen a lot of monuments, etc. Didn't the Prussians put anything up? I know there were mm. exactly Johnny Cumberland. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, well... Mm. <laughs> Uh, well, we'd probably say that in present company, but to me, <laughs> um, I mean, now the Prussian take on all this is completely different. If you, now I mentioned Wellington's dispatch, but now if you read the Prussian dispatch on the Waterloo campaign, it's you know, those, those English chaps, they were you know, putting up a damn good show, but, you know, they, but luckily, for, luckily for them, we were, we were coming along, and you know, they see themselves as very much the victors, the victors yeah. And actually, uh, there's been some you know, controversial stuff written in the last 10, 15 years about this. But if you if you see Waterloo as a campaign over four days, and not just the battle on the 18th, then you can't really argue with the fact that there are more German soldiers involved than British ones. In fact, in Wellington's army at Waterloo, I mean, 
you know, it's, a, it's, it's a minority that are British. So, you know, to be fair to them, I mean, <laughs> they do see it like that. And yes, they do memorialise it. In actual fact, the, uh, the 50th anniversary, when I showed you the Times editorial, sort of playing it all down, the, uh, actually in Prussia and Berlin and Hanover and so on, there are great celebrations. And the Times says, oh, no, no, this is all very triumphalist. We don't go in for that, us British. So, yes, they did. There's a, there's a book out, ooh, chap at York University, because he makes reference to my book, which is pleasing. <laughs> um, but but it's, it's a very short book on Waterloo, but it's four or five short chapters, and one is on the British perception, and one is on the Prussian, one is, so it, it sort of looks at that very question, really. In yep. your opinion, um, why was it politically acceptable ten years ago to have such an international celebration of Trafalgar 200, and yet ten years later, when it comes to something which could be arguably called a more significant event, it's gone off with a damp squid? I would love to know. And see, I, had to, I, had to, I, mean, I, I finished writing the book in the summer of 2013, <laughs> and I had to sort of put in a, a couple of paragraphs about what was going to happen in 2015, which historian predicting the future, not a, not a good idea. Uh, but I did say, I, I think it will be essentially low-key. I think there was probably more finally happened than I was perhaps suggesting. Although not much did happen. I mean, the National Service of Commemoration, for example, wasn't mentioned on the main news. And I mentioned that statue that was unveiled by Prince Charles at Ugamon, but that was paid for privately by British businessmen. It's got nothing to do with British government. So even then, you see, it's not been... So yeah, I don't know. I, mean, I, I was at a reception in London in May, and there was someone there who'd been involved in the Trafalgar 200. And I asked him this very question. You know, why? Why is it different? Because the French and the Spanish didn't seem so sensitive. No, it's, it's odd, isn't it? No, it's very odd. And my recollection of uh, 2005 is that there was quite a lot going on. Yes. Now, I, well, I, I, well, I'm told by friends that live up north, well, we didn't think there was much going on. It's because you live down south and you're close to Portsmouth. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure that the big fleet review and so on, that was all televised, wasn't it? Yes. And I, I'm sure you could look it up. And so, so Spanish ships that That's right, yeah. So much, much more went on. I think a key element of it was, and I was around at the time, um, was that Trafalgar had a champion, um, which Waterloo never did. The champion of Trafalgar in 2005 was the first sea lord, um, Alan West, Lord mm -hmm. West of Spitlake, mm -hmm. who saw Trafalgar as an opportunity at a time when the Royal Navy was um, being subjected to a never-ending um, series of cuts to um, give the Royal Navy prominence um, in the public psyche. In 2015, and in the lead up to it, there was never the same enthusiasm for it from within the army. And General uh, Evelyn Webb Carter, who was persuaded by the 8th Duke of Wellington, on Waterloo 200 would tear his hair out for the previous five years to get any recognition at all from the British government that this bicentenary was coming up and it would be appropriate to recognise it. It's, it's, it's still odd though, isn't it? Because... I mean, is it partly because Trafalgar was much more about national survival and, and you know, Nelson was killed he's a, he's a much more uncontroversial hero because once you start <coughs> talking about Waterloo I mean that wasn't about national survival was it? I mean no, and let's say for the sake of argument that Napoleon had won Waterloo I mean I think realistically he was going to get beaten probably by the Austrians and the Prussians shortly afterwards and we certainly weren't going to get invaded if we lost the Battle of Waterloo. And the great British hero didn't get killed. So we can more... I can see how we can sort of more obviously unite behind Trafalgar and so on. Because uh, we don't have to pay attention to the foreigners, dare one say. Whereas you know, at Waterloo, it is 
part of a much bigger coalition thing. But you know, what you say is, is, is really interesting, isn't it? Mm-hmm. And you know, the British government was loath to, cre- to contribute even a penny to it. And actually, you know, finally gave a million pounds. But the British government provided £40 million pounds to celebrate, which I think is dreadful, the wrong word, the outbreak of the First World War in 2014. I'm quite happy to see money spent on the ending of the First World War, but... £40 million pounds is a lot of money. When they say they won't give a penny for, no, initially, for Waterloo 200. Every year, the Navy has a Trafalgar night dinner uh, in October. Uh, does the Army have a, well, uh, a Waterloo night? Well, I'm not a military man, I wouldn't know. I'm guessing that regiments have Waterloo dinners. Someone can enlighten yes. me, perhaps. They do. And, yeah. um, there's a member of the audience yeah. here, George Elliott, who would know that the 52nd Light Infantry commemorated Waterloo annually mm. year on yeah. year. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, I think I'm right, George, you probably had That's an annual dream. dinner when you were able. About uh, on the 10th, 11th of every, every year in June, um, in the Oriental, we have a Waterloo dinner in which there are about eight or nine tables of 10 to 15, uh, all the regiments who st- continue to show an interest in celebrating um, Waterloo. What is quite interesting from our point of view, it is well supported by old national servicemen who still mm, come yeah. together um, on those occasions. And. Um, I think it will continue for a good many years. Yeah. See, I, I think that's how it always was. I mean, obviously, there's tons in the book that I haven't talked about here, but if you, you know, what, what's going on when Wellington is alive is that each Waterloo Day, you might, because it's the middle of summer, it's a great time for a British village to have a fate. And so you, you'll, you'll choose Waterloo because it's a great day to have it. But you do get veterans meeting up reg, in regimental dinners and so forth. But the uh, time you get to, say, the 1850s or 60s, it might literally be just two or three who meet down the local pub, but it makes the local press because they're Waterloo veterans. And, and that's what they do. And then they literally carry on you know, until they, they just f- fade away. And uh, Interestingly enough, Preston was a place where they had a, a local cotton spinner who was obsessed with Waterloo, so he paid for an annual dinner in Preston. And you get about maybe 50 or 60 turning up, down to about 1861. And I think that was the last sort of big public one of any, any sort of consequence. But even after that, you do get twos or threes in places like Sheffield or Leicester or whatever. So that's what happens. As you say, that tradition continues. Good. Mike, thank you, John. Um, I, I passed through it most weeks, uh, Waterloo. It was a really lovely um, discussion about why that station is going to be called Waterloo. And of course, the irony of it was that when the Eurostars first came in, the French were brought into Waterloo. So um, I, I've never actually asked, thought to ask the question, why was it called Waterloo? No, uh, I've been asked that before. I, I can't tell you exactly why it is, but... <laughs> well, well, no, well, yeah, because, um, yeah, I mean, exactly. I mean, wh- where it is, it is, is literally you walk out the station onto Waterloo Bridge. So what otherwise, what otherwise would it be called? Uh, the station is, I think, from 1849... Um, I mean, you're right that the French were terribly unhappy about it and they threatened to rename Garden or Astolitz or something. But uh, <laughs> no, they were, again, the Mayor of Paris was very upset at the time. Um, but no, I think I think that's why. It's literally because it comes into where the where the bridge was. It wasn't called Waterloo Station initially, was it? My understanding is that um, it was called something else. Um, but it then became so obviously identifiable with the station at Waterloo yeah, and the bridge, bridge. Yeah, right. that it then translated into Waterloo Station. I think Waterloo was always in the title. Was it? Yeah, I think so. Well, you've written a book. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the more you know, the less you know. That's yeah, what you can say. <laughs> well, there's just so much that... Okay. Uh, I commend the book to you. <laughs> This is my personal copy, you can't have it. Uh, but Russ has bought uh, half a dozen. I've got a few, but not many. For those who might like to um, buy a copy or under no compulsion to do so, but um, I do commend it to you. Uh, I learned a great deal. And actually, one of the things I, that I reminded myself about this evening is how history repeats itself. 
because when you were talking about the three principal outcomes that revealed themselves in the immediate years after Waterloo, one was of course peace and tranquility, the other was industrial prosperity. But what we often forget is the peace dividend because um, history repeats itself. There was a peace dividend after the Seven Years' War. There was another one after the American War of Independence. We do this every time we have a war, and immediately afterwards, we look for the peace dividend. And the consequences then haunt us, and arguably become the reason for the next war. <laughs> now, um, just before I um, publicly thank um, Russ, um, our program of events for Waterloo uh, continues. Uh, we have the th third Waterloo seminar on the 1st of August, uh, looking at why, Waterloo, at why Napoleon lost and Wellington won the Battle of Waterloo, and there's a flyer for it on the table at the back. And we have our fourth and final Waterloo seminar on the 5th of August, when having given so much prominence, George, from the 52nd Light Infantry this year. Uh, I really felt that we owed it to the 95th Rifles to give a little bit of prominence <laughs> to the first 95th uh, at Quatre Bras and Waterloo. In fact, I think there are some who had rather forgotten they were even there. Uh, and um, <clears throat> Russ also mentioned um, Stratfield Say House. For those of you who, who are interested, we are running a friend's visit to Stratfield Day House on the 10th of September. I think there are still one or two places available on it. And if you've never been to Stratfield Day House, I strongly recommend it. The, the visit program includes a tour of the house by the expert guides, which I was most impressed when I did it last year. It includes a talk centered on the, um, the uh, Wellington's funeral carriage, which, as some of you may know, is in the stable block at Stratfield Fay House. And we'll also be talking about the commander's forces at Stratfield Say because Copenhagen's grave is, uh, is there. So if you are interested, please have a word to Christine, the, the, the curator. But um, that's enough from me. It just remains to thank you. Russ, very much indeed, for all the time and preparation um, you put into your talk. Um, and we're getting used to speakers speaking without notes, and you did it again. Thank you very much indeed. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Wine and canapes, just round the corner.